Thank you, and great that you're joining us this morning to review the dailies. We'll get to the curfew a little bit later on, but let's start with the headline on the standard, which says the new Uhuru. And of course, for anybody who might want a description of who the new Uhuru is vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Uhuru that we were used to, he was initially uh, looked at as docile. Everything literally passed through him, and he seemed to be okay with anything and everything. Right now, we are looking at a more assertive uh, you know a president uh, he was um, you know more or less not cautious and consulted literally uh, everybody for everything including the deputy president that has changed uh, canon weather do you agree that we have a new president as opposed to what we were used to earlier no i think the president still remains uh, the president we need it is only that there's a new style you know, if you have two years to the end of your presidency, you can end up being irrelevant. People are just looking for who will be president next. So to reconsolidate and to remain the center of focus until the end, and also to gain extra power to manage the coming transition, to manage the question of uh, the, the suggested constitutional review, all this requires the constitution of, of his own power. And I think that is a what comes. He remains a very amiable, laughing, nice uh, president, but I can tell you occasionally it can be very tough. So he's just showing some aspects of his character for purposes of what is ahead, which is constitutional review, embedded the um, uh, end of his term, and, and, and the possibility that if he does not assert himself, people can easily ignore him and say, no, 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 this one is a spent force we are looking and investing for the future. So that is why he is, and he's reinvigorated by the presence of Honor Braila on his side. So he's much stronger. Calculated move given that uh, I'm reminded of a speech by one David Murade when Uhuru was getting to the end of his first term. And it seems the president we are seeing now and what Murada described then are very similar because he said he's going to be ruthless. In fact, he said that even me, uh, referring to himself, uh, as Murade would not be spared should he go on the wrong side of the president. So was this a calculated move, do you think? Uh, definitely, the president himself has no change, but he needed to consolidate power and to win elections. Remember the first election? They needed to win it together in order for them to also start off the ICC. Then they needed to stay in it and then win again because there was steep opposition from uh, Honor Braila's side. But now things have settled. Things have settled and they're looking to a situation where they're not looking for votes. And his true color is, is coming. It's, 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 it's not that he has um, suddenly acquired some trade powers. Mm. It is that, just that he's very, very calculated. He can wait until the end, until things have settled, until the Honda Braila is in the box, until the deputy president is taken care of. Then now he says, for the remaining period, I also want to lead and I want to be the center of attraction. It's, it's not ruthlessness. It is big time. I want you to look at history. Look at President Moore. He was president until the last day in 1992. Nobody took him for granted, including even after President Mark was elected. He was still in charge until he left uh, state house. So this is, I think, the, the tutorship that uh, President Uru has taken. And he wants to be in charge until the last day. Not irrelevant, not lambda. And he has used the word lambda. I will not be lambda. That is... Um, the basis upon which these things are happening. All right, and maybe we also just look at the headlines on the Daily Nation because it's to do with the same. And why the headline is why Uhuru's power deal with Ruto failed. And according to this particular uh, article, it actually refers to the deputy president as an impatient athlete. In other words, if you looked at a uh, relay run, you would expect that uh, one athlete waits until the baton is hardened over to them. Uh, but according to this article, the deputy president seemed to be almost taking that baton by force and prematurely. Do you agree? No, 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 no. I think this is the kind of deputy president who did not want to speak but wait to be given power. The day when power will be handed over is long gone. Otherwise, it would have been handed to Honorable Kadosum Sioka. It would have been handed to Honorable um, uh, 
Musalem, Rabbi, you have seen we have uh, vice presidents who have not been able to ascend to power. And the way they ascended to power was not waiting to be given. 2013, even President Kibaki did not give it to them. They went out and took it. In fact, at some time, at some point, they were requested to leave. So from that knowledge, having worked with Honor Braila, having worked with President Boy, having worked with uh, President Kibak, I really don't think that the deputy president would have been uh, wise to sit and wait when he knows that that would not give you power. So for now, I think just to put him into perspective, people would say, oh, you tried to get it before time, you had to do it. But the question is looking for votes because now you have to be elected. So I, I really don't think it should be faulted on the basis that he tried to take it. And that uh, uh, kind of analysis is really not accurate. If you take it's not accurate. All right. Okay, so that's matters politics uh, on page two, just for the benefit of uh, our viewers, and maybe you'll get your comments on this weather. Beware that plastic water bottles could land you in jail. And this is if you visit any of the national parks using a disposable plastic water bottle, you could end up in jail. And uh, the fine is between two to three million or a jail term of up to three years. A reusable uh, plastic bottle is fine, but uh, the disposable ones that we're used to are not allowed in national parks. And this became, uh, you know, effective as from 5th of this month. So, of course, uh, becoming aware of the environment. Maybe just your comments on this weather. I think that is a cause for celebration, and that is a cause we thank God for. We wish uh, 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 one of my mentors, uh, Professor Wangari Madai, was alive, but I know she's smiling because if you look at the way we have uh, come after burning the plastic bags, uh, it means we, are, we, are, we have received a lot of success. It is now much better, and the problem now is these plastics all over, people throwing them out of their car windows, throwing them all over, and they're killing our animals, our heritage, our, our, some of the sources of our income. So having had that regulation, that law coming in the first, I think it is something we celebrate. You look at our oceans. Now they are full of those plastic things, and these things don't, do not uh, disintegrate for over a long time. So it is very good. A win for the environmentalists, a win for us, a win for the coming generation, their grandchildren. In fact, the, the creator of all things says that a good man invests for the children of his or our children. Where are children. So yeah. that's a good uh, investment. Okay, no. where, where, whereas that is a good start, there's still a long way to go, given that we still litter, we still throw things out of our car windows and all over. We seem not to be uh, fully aware of the effects of this to the environment. Do you think we need stringent and stricter rules to ensure that those who litter, you know, face the law and the full arm of the law to ensure that we reduce this and stop this completely? I think we need it. In fact, what we need is our own community policing, ourselves. We police ourselves. Now we have cameras. We have uh, cameras on our phones. Interestingly, we use the, the wrong things. We are, I saw a cartoon where they say somebody's drowning and is lifting his hand up or her hand up. Instead of picking the hand, you, 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 you take a hand. Let's uh, <coughs> police each other so that when somebody is driving ahead of you and you are throwing things, they are able to take that. And then, we have regulations where you can be followed and punished. In Nairobi, I think we have the bylaws. It's only that they are not being enforced. Mm. You see people eating and spitting and throwing things. You sometimes you wonder whether we are having our own country or we are having a country, somebody's country where you throw things. You throw. So I think we need more strictness in enforcing those environmental regulations throughout the country, throughout the place, so that we don't throw these things anyhow later and then kill our own um, ecosystem. Our own environment. All right, uh, on page three of the standard is an interesting article there. And thirsty Kenyans keep bars open and flout rules. This, of course, is as they waited for the president to lift the ban 
on, you know, or rather to lift the curfew uh, that was in place, but that, of course, did not happen. But it didn't stop Kenyans from partying and going uh, and flouting rules, literally. And this may be where there would be a good time for us to look at what is likely to happen once we declare, you know, things open and people to go back to uh, pubs and bars, despite the fact that, of course, there's going to be those rules and regulations. I think one, uh, one, one, people should get this very clear. President Uru did not close the country, did not declare the curfew. The curfew was declared by coronavirus. It is the one that dictated that these things had to be done. And for us to have our freedom back, we have to put that coronavirus under our feet. Mm. Scientists, researchers have given us the various ways in which we overcome. Some countries have actually overcome. So if we think that it is the president, he will wake up and open up when the figures show that the infectious rates are going up and when the figures are high, we are really, really mistaken. So I can see even yesterday, I saw quite a number of people as I was coming away towards um, Isenia. You see quite a number of people in bars uh, drinking and having made. Yes, you may drink, but you, you will spread this condition, you will spread uh, the virus, and it will, tell, it will make us stay longer in the restrictions. So people should know that their actions affect the economy, affect the period in which we stay under restriction. Hmm. If right. they tell we can control this virus in a day, yes. All right, and uh, that's, that's that on page uh, three. And of course, Trix is going to be looking at the effects of, uh, on the economy of uh, the curfew. And now that it has been extended, what exactly does that mean, particularly when we're looking at rebuilding our economy? Let's now reflect on page four, where we have matters politics. Raila and Atwali plot the next move on BBI as Duale faces do or die a week. Now, it is expected that the majority leader, Adan Duale, is likely to face the axe as majority leader in the National Assembly this week. Do you think that's going to happen? Uh, we do have the chief whip, uh, you know, Kanini Kega, who has been collecting signatures and apparently has, uh, I think, uh, over 120 signatures already from members of parliament. And according to Murade, who is the deputy chair for Jubilee, he says if they gather enough you know, um, support and evidence that uh, he has lost confidence of the members of parliament, the party will have to act. Your thoughts on how this is likely to roll out this week? I think uh, if the president has set his eyes on uh, having him removed, which seems to be on the higher propensity, then he will be removed. Not because the members have lost confidence in him, it is because the members themselves cannot stand their ground. They, they, you saw the way the debate was in the Senate when they were debating about the professor. Uh, they were saying, we love you so much. You are very good. In fact, we don't know why you are being removed. You have done a very good job, but you are whatever. So this, uh, it will resonate back because some of these uh, members of parliament, they fear that they may lose their elections up. Some of them fear the DCI may be unleashed on them. Some of them fear the pair in the defense of them. So they, they also have skeletons, and with these skeletons, they can't stand their ground either against their party leaders or even against the president if he was to put his foot mm. down. So if that is the decision, then I think if the president wants it for now, I think he will be released because the deputy president also seemed to have changed the tap. They be like, let's move on. Let's buy time. We still have two years, so let's be careful. Let's not have a fully blown fight. Let's harvest what is called sympathy. Let's appear like we're being annihilated, we're being fought, we're being uh, killed for no reason. So I think if that's what the president wants, and you can see from uh, the Kanye uh, Kega and all those, then Duale may be walking on a very thin line.
very thin line. And, and your thoughts on what Atwali's role is in this? Uh, this particular article is titled, Ryla and Atwali plot the next move on BBI. And of course, we do know that the Building Bridges Initiative has uh, sort of regained its momentum, and we're expecting the report to be out any time now. But your, your, your predictions and your um, thoughts on what Atwali's role is, is in all this. Remember that not too long ago, there was uh, a meeting that apparently took place in his uh, you know, premises and ended up in having Wetangula and Mudavadi as uh, removed as Luya elders. Now we have him and Raila coming together and possibly agreeing on a few things on the BBI. What do you think his role is? The thing is uh, that uh, those there is a feeling that there are some people opposed to the proposed changes in the, the constitution. And those people are likely to be the deputy president, they are likely to be Honorable Salem Nabadi. So that notwithstanding what they are saying, notwithstanding what they are saying that we support, there is no trust. And the BBI team also fear that if there was a formidable opposition, either the BBI would fail, the proposed changes would fail, or alternatively, a sizable portion of Kenya's would vote against it, thereby denying the changes a credibility. So that even if they were to be affected, there is a chunk, a high percentage of people who say no. So to forestall this and to control votes from uh, the lawyer region, uh, in case uh, Honorable Musale, whatever the votes out, uh, Honorable Atuli is there to ensure that there is a semblance that these people are cut to size. Cut any form of position, cut Musale Mudamadi, cut Honorable um, Wetangola, and any perceived position. Meanwhile, also on the other side, the president and Honorable Raila would cut the deputy president so that when the BBI uh, report comes, you just receive it and people say, We have agreed who is opposed it. The rest will oppose as small people can be crushed early in the morning before the voting time. So I think the dice is about ensuring that the changes are affected, whether the leaders love it, whether many people hate it, they will not be having time to organize the church to say no. So right. the dice is as, as to the amendments. Mm. We, we've seen political yeah. parties, starting with Jubilee, uh, the likes of uh, ODM, literally cleaning up and mopping up those who are termed as rebels and them being ousted. Do you think this is also in preparation to the Building Bridges Initiative to ensure that by, uh, you know, by hook or by crook, it must go through? Yes, I think it is uh, the, 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 not the cleaning that they are rebels. It is to show muscle so that uh, these people get scared. And, and then to deny them, uh, uh, there are some MPs who took loans, I know, to build houses and do whatever, and they survived more on the committee meetings. Now, this committee meeting, you are removed into it, you are left strictly on the parliamentary uh, salary. That may not be enough to meet your obligations. So this is to ensure that they have fear. Fear that uh, if you try to say no, if the amendments were to come, then there will be as extra um, uh, repercussions. So the whole part in the political parties is to send a message that will then send a chill in the hearts of the members of parliament, as the National Assembly and the Senate, and they will toe the line. Then when the party leaders say left, we go left. When they say right, they go right. When they say center, that is what they are working towards. All right, let's wait and see how that is going to pan out. But it looks like the Building Bridges Initiative proposal is one that is going to see the light of day. Let's now take a look at the Daily Nation. We've already looked at the headline, and for the benefit of anybody who might be joining us now, the headline is why Uhuru's power deal uh, with Ruto failed. And get yourself a copy to see what that is all about. But there's also another article there on the front page uh, on the budget with a 2.7 trillion budget that we have in 
Kenya, uh, which are the sectors that are likely to get the lion's share? And number one on that list is education. I'll just read through some of them and uh, then get your comments read on what you think. Uh, 2.7 trillion budget is a huge budget, uh, but education and teachers is uh, on the front line. We have infrastructure, we have interior, we have national treasury and defense. Uh, we also have health on part of the ones that are going to get the lion's share. Maybe just your brief comments on this weather as we wait for this to be ironed out. Yeah, I think if you look at uh, interior education, let people uh, understand that the bulk of the budgeted money is basically current expenditure. Salaries, rents, and all the equipment, and then the money that is set the secondary schools and um, universities for purposes is called a transfer fund, the one that government transfers for free secondary education or support. That is why it looks so big. The part that you be able, you should look at is to look at how much of that is development expenditure, infrastructure, and you find it is very, very little. Go, also, adding to the fact that in the post-COVID experience, there will be a reduced the collection and um, the kind of money that the care will collect, I think it will come down from uh, almost to uh, 1.8 or 1.9 billion uh, trillion to, to, to much less because now businesses are not uh, functioning. Mm. So, looking at those allocations, you, you will see that a lot of it is the current expenditure, not development. All right. And, uh, of course, uh, on the Daily Nation, if you get yourself a copy, you'll see those, uh, you know, um, allocations for the 2.7 trillion. Uh, top 10 spenders in billions is listed right there. But, of course, the other thing that has hit Kenya quite hard, and not just Kenya, but the world over, is uh, joblessness. When corona landed, we lost our livelihoods. There's an article there. And, of course, we do know that the youth and uh, Kenyans had generally uh, very high rates of unemployment, but of course COVID-19 has now made that a little bit more difficult. Maybe just to weigh in on this weather and what you feel that possibly government needs to do in light of this budget and the job losses to ensure that we create jobs for the youth, because if we do not do that, regardless of COVID-19, then of course we're going to have other sectors suffer, like security, for example. Yes, I think uh, the way the government has handled the pandemic is fairly commendable and uh, there's a bit of hope. One of the things that's going to affect the economy is fear. So in Italy, after they concluded that they were able to bring down the COVID effect, uh, people still refuse to come out. And remember, the, 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 the people who are most vulnerable are the core. The, the, the core people most vulnerable are the, uh, the business owners, the big business owners. If they are scared, they will not come out. So what government will do would be to ensure that there is sufficient testing, there is sufficient confidence. And then by the bulk of the people are employed in small businesses, small businesses that um, take care that your car industry, the mamambogas, and, and the middle level of uh, business. So these businesses, there are some organized businesses that the government may be able to look for funds to either give them as a loan or as, as, as minimal capital to keep running as the economy reopens. One other area which has been hit and will continue to be hit is the tourism industry. That industry, uh, some money will have to be injected to keep the hotels running and then to attract new people by assuring them that Kenya is fairly safe by showing our figures. Mm. The other, uh, luckily, uh, we are in a pandemic, but there is food. You can see food coming uh, from the farms and so on and so forth. But several farmers have suffered losses. Again, this government may have to address the budget so that those who have lost their farming capacity due to the pandemic are cushioned. Otherwise, if they sink, then we will see the effects in the following season. All right, Ambrose Weda, because of time, we are.